Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome to the Connect Plus webinar series. It's called the Win the Amenities Race, Connect Your Building with Customized Transportation Solutions. I am your moderator for today. My name is Justin Shore. I'm a principal with Wells & Associates, and I lead our transportation demand management planning practice. For those of you that don't know Wells & Associates, we're a transportation firm with a mission to meet the needs of a mobile society. Uh, the way we do that is through a combination of full service, traffic engineering, transportation planning, transportation amenity design, installation, and management, as well as personal travel assistance. Before we dive into our uh, panelists today, uh, there are a couple housekeeping items that I wanted to share with you. One is that uh, if you haven't figured it out already, you are all on uh, automatically on mute. Um, and because of that, we won't have an opportunity for you to verbalize your questions. So we ask that you enter your questions into the control panel on the right part of your screen. Uh, out of respect to our panelists, we ask if you can please hold those questions till the end so that we can minimize disruption to them. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so the question that this webinar series is asking is, who is winning the amenities race? And we thought we might even ask, better yet, who is not winning the amenities race? And if you, are, if you know of Rock Spring Business Park in suburban DC, it's one of the, the types of office parks that is not winning the amenities race. It has a 30% vacancy rate. It has entire buildings that are completely empty. And it's the kind of place that few companies want to lease. The question we keep asking is, well, why is that? And when you look around and try to find those answers, what Mayop has to say is that because of demand for renovated space, tenants are increasingly looking to landlords to provide high value tenant improvement packages as part of the lease. But these TI packages have become especially important to tenants who are looking to customize office space to attract and retain their future, current and future workforce millennials. And those folks are favoring access to public transport and to amenities. The challenge for the struggling class B and C commercial space is that they don't typically have access to public transport and amenities. So then the next question of, amongst industry leaders is, what do they think the answer is that, to that? What is the solution? The Urban Land Institute had a technical assistance panel in the DC area to look at that Rock Spring Business Park. And they identified a bunch of things, everything from having gateways to creating a pedestrian-oriented environment, providing shuttles, even providing bike share and bike connections. Oxford, in its destination collaboration report, said that work for, the workforce of the future will be much more selective in seeking its career opportunities and employers, and it'll be looking for those that are within a reasonable commute and are close to lifestyle amenities and accessible transit routes. So the question is, what are the common themes that all these industry leaders are saying? Is the opportunity here and they agree sort of universally that some combination of amenities mobility sustainability and transportation play a key role in helping make a building more appealing and ultimately uh, help it achieve its occupancy goals so the question we are posing for this entire webinar series is who is providing these solutions nationwide so our connect plus webinar series is a six-part series looking at various properties and case studies across the nation that address various aspects of transportation amenities. The first one we'll be talking about today is how ride hailing can help offset the costs of shuttle. In January, we'll be beginning the new year with relocation assistance. And relocation assistance is focused a little bit on a proactive approach where we're finding large employers that are moving to a new building 
are really trying to understand the impact that that move has on their employees' morale and make sure they understand what their transportation options are before they ever move there. Moving on to February, we'll be looking at how bicycle amenities, everything from bike rooms and bike storage to bike share stations, play a key role in helping different properties lease up. In March, we're going to move on to talk about information dissemination. And in particular, we're talking about transportation information. This is sort of like a concierge type of service that uh, many buildings are providing to their tenants as a way to make their tenants feel more comfortable with commuting to and from the building. And then rounding out the spring, we'll be moving on to talk about public space programming and the role it plays in keeping, get, having people arrive before and after work and have a more positive experience when they go home at the end of the day. And finally, we'll be rounding out our series with wayfinding and the role that helping people understand how best to navigate a site makes for a positive first and last experience when they travel to that building. So today, our focus is on office shuttle cost reduction and ride hailing implementation. And the case study that we are focused on is AMA Plaza. For those of you that may not know, AMA Plaza is a 1.5 million square foot multi-tenant office building, but it also has the Langham Hotel inside of it. It's in Chicago's River North neighborhood, and it's been presented with BOMA's International uh, Outstanding Building of the Year Award, the TOBI, in the over 1 million square foot category. But for more than 10 years, AMA Plaza has provided shuttle services to connect its tenants with the nearest major rail terminals, LaSalle, Ogilvy, and Union stations. But about a year ago, AMA Plaza decided to change its approach to connecting those tenants with these train stations by removing a shuttle stop and replacing it with lift service. So our panel today is going to talk about that change from three different perspectives. We have Shane McLaughlin from Beacon Capital Partners. We have Susan Hammer, uh, with JLL. She'll be talking from the property management's perspective. And last but certainly not least, we have Charles Frank with Lyft, who will be talking about the operations side of it from Lyft's perspective and how we were able to get that up and running. So to speak about the owner's perspective is Shane McLaughlin with Beacon Capital Partners. For those of you that may not know, Beacon Capital Partners is a tenant-focused real estate investment firm with a 70-year legacy of successful real estate development, ownership, and management. Shane is the Vice President for Asset Management for Beacon, and he oversees 5 million square feet of commercial office space in both Metro DC and Chicago. Uh, we've known Shane for a long time, and he's been a true leader in advancing innovative transportation solutions, both at the properties that he oversees, as well as in the communities where he works. He's very active with the Tyson's partnership as an executive committee board member and a co-chairman of its transportation council. So without further ado, I will turn the panel over to Shane so he can share with us the owner's perspective on the AMA Plaza shuttle and the changes that were made. Shane? Thanks, Justin. That was good timing. I learned I just sat down. <laughs> um, sorry, I missed your introduction on everything. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, we're excited to continue to work with Justin and on these uh, interesting transportation programs. So the site that we're talking about is based in Chicago um, called AMA Plaza. Um, I apologize if I'm repeating anything. I missed the intro. Um, but it's a, a great historic designated building uh, in the River North. Um, you know, uh, submarket. Um, so Chicago is interesting to me. I'm based here in DC and started working there uh, to support our team outside. And, uh, you know, it has, you know, a very big uh, suburban area that wraps the entire city and a lot of commuters that come in. So there are a lot of properties that have, especially trophy properties that have, you know, really great shuttle systems coming from the two main branches uh, of the uh, commuter rail station. So when we looked at it, uh, Susan and her team had, like I said, a really high-end shuttle in place, um, and you know it was getting good usage, you know, from the tenants, but uh, it was at a pretty a pretty high cost that we hadn't seen previously uh, in Metro DC or any any of our other properties. So um, you know, just 
doing our job and our due diligence, we looked into it a little bit closer. Um, I talked to Justin, who I'd worked with in D.C. Uh, many times, and um, you know, we we went through the data. And fortunately, the the proper the the company running the shuttle, had, you know, kept very good data, and so it was pretty clear that. Um, there was one station, there were three stops when we bought the property, and there was one station that was really underutilized. Uh, and we found, you know, we went through the scenario and, um, you know, looked at different options, and we found that, you know, removing a shuttle, removing one shuttle stop uh, from our normal loop, um, we would able to, we'd be able to reduce the shuttles from four shuttles down to three, significantly impacting our costs by over 20%. Uh, and then we were able to put in, you know, a really, uh, you know, cool alternate transportation in the third stop that we eliminated using lift and geocoding to the spot, which I think everybody else will get into the details a little bit later on on it. But um, so we were able to, you know, continue to service the station um, and provide better head times of the shuttle and not diminish the quality of the shuttle. You know, we could definitely go in with you know, uh, a more of a city metro bus type shuttle versus, you know, like a luxury shuttle. Um, but we wanted to keep the value there. Um, but, you know, we we, we thought that, uh, you know, there was a better solution and, you know, it, it came to fruition. So, um, you know, Beacon in general is a value add company. We're not a long term holder of commercial real estate. Um, so when we buy a property, um, you know, we're really pegged with um, looking at some uh, creative solutions uh, to the space. Um, that's our biggest role of asset, our, our, our role of the asset management side, um, and you know, staying ahead of this race. So we're looking at you know physical and non-physical amenities. You know, what can we do? You know, to continue to market and lease our space. Um, you know, that's that's the ultimate goal. Um, so providing transportation options. You know, very quickly. Um, I think we'll go through all of these, but um, you know, it, it's part of you know, existing tenants, it's part of future tenants, and it's part of financial implications uh, that we'll uh, keep going through here. Um, so we look at options, you know, as I said, we're a value add company. Our role as asset managers are, are always value add. Um, so we, we look at everything um, from the start. And, you know, if we can provide, you know, the same or better solution, I think that was always, you know, my conversation with Justin is I don't want to diminish the value of the, of the solution or of the shuttle, you know, but I want to find a more efficient way to do it. You know, I find that we find ourselves being efficiency experts at, at times is whether it's, you know, financially or creatively, you know, through a, a project is how do we do it most efficiently? Um, you know, we're not going to just take the lowest bid at everything that we do. Uh, and we always have to look at what's the best value, you know, for our clients. Um, so why we chose, we talked about a little bit, you know, we're seeking flexible options and, um, you know, we, we have to look at these things on a global scale. Um, you know, our, our shuttles at AMA, it was over $600,000 a year to operate. Um, you know, and in most places, our shuttles are, you know, well, you know, probably average around 100 or $125,000. Um, so that's that's what, what what got us into it initially, and then we think of it on a global scale too. You know, um, typical use of a shuttle is less than 10% of the building occupants. So we have to use the money of all the tenants, you know, as efficiently as possible. So it, we have to be respectful for the 90% of people that don't use a shuttle and and not just you know throw their money out the window. So that's what gets us looking at is what are the actual you know number of people that are using. Um, you know, using the shuttles and using the amenities all over. And at the same time, um, you know, Beacon has an industry-leading sustainability program. We've certified over 40 million square feet of office space in, you know, for LEED certification. So there's the added benefit of my job. You know, uh, we're finance people, and you know, it's improving NOI and you know, and and, and providing returns for our investors and our company. But there's always, you know, the the extra benefit of you know these sustainability programs. So whether it's reducing trip counts or the number of shuttles on the road or, you know, utilizing, you know, lift vehicles and, and transportation that's currently there versus duplicating efforts, you know, we're reducing our carbon emissions and, you know, doing the right thing for, you know, for the planet at the same time. So, you know, as I mentioned, obviously we're a for-profit company and marketing and leasing is our biggest thing. You know, we're a value-add company, so we come in, we renovate a building, we lease it, and then we sell it off to a long-term investor. You know, our typical hold is maybe five to seven years. 
um, where the typical real estate hold is 15 to 17 years. Um, so think of it as we don't like to call it flipping a house because we're, you know, uh, we think we're much higher quality uh, trophy assets that that um, we're producing. But if you can flip a residential property in, you know, five to seven months, we're doing it in commercial in five to seven years, uh, just because of the size of it. So. What transportation does for us, you know, um, the competition for space, it's still a tough market. You know, real estate has, um, it, it's on the back end of the bell curve with the economy. The economy is getting better since the recession in 2007, 2008. Um, our, certain markets are coming back, but competition for a lease is, is still out there. Large law firms, government agencies, they're all still you know, using more efficient footprints, so they're reducing their size. You know, there's not as much space needed. Um, so where the, the landlords are competing with record high concession prices and TI packages and really competitive lease rates. So anything we can do is an added value. We have physical amenities like conference rooms and lounges and secure bike rooms and you know anything we can do, a coffee kiosk, rooftop decks, you know, but there's only so much space we can build. And that's where we go into the next phase of non-physical amenities. Those are things like health and wellness programs and yoga studios and classes and cooking demonstrations and, and transportation. You know, I think that so many people ride in a single occupant vehicle that a lot of buildings just assume that that's happening and they don't really care for a solution because they think that they, it won't change people's mind. But if you can save people time or money, then they're going to change their behavior and use some of these alternate transportation. So programs like this are, we actually do use this as marketing and, you know, we put that out there during tours of what our transportation programs are and what options that they have. So it is a clear market differentiator. Um, really quickly on the same note, you know, there's times when a decision maker who's signing a lease, you know, they may have 10,000 employees. Sometimes they just have to check the box and say that there, there's transportation options or they're in, you know, within a half mile of walking uh, of the distance, you know, to a metro station or not. But sometimes it is a real decision. There's, and we're seeing that more and more that these that corporations are becoming more conscious of the environment and more conscious of their employee needs. Recruitment of, for them is is just as hard as it is competing for a lease for us. Um, you know, so they really are using transportation uh, options at times instead of just checking the box like the old days with number of parking spaces and conference room and whatever. They're really looking into this as a real value of the assets you know that they're, that they're working on. So at the end of the day, it is a financial implication for us. You know, the AMA shuttle program, um, you know, it's uh, it, it's an expensive um, amenity to provide with, like I said, less than, a you know, about a 10% usage rate. Um, and, and we need to make those global decisions that affect the entire property. Um, you know, we replaced, um, you know, the large expensive shuttles with on-demand services. It was an immediate impact. We went from four shuttles down to three. Um, and, you know, reduce our expenses by over 20%. Um, you know, and, and those, that 20% reduction on a $600,000 expense is enough to raise somebody's eyebrows and, you know, and understand that it's a significant improvement to our NOI. Granted, the building's a million, you know, 1.2 million feet of office space, you know, but a 20% reduction on that is, you know, certainly enough, you know, for a value, um, you know, that we can create. Um, this is just the brief review of AMA Plaza. It's been a small sample size, but Susan will go into it a little bit more with the, the tenant feedback. But I think overall, you know, we got a lot of kickback. People don't like to change their behavior. That's the hardest thing with transportation that Justin and, and Courtney fight all the time. It, it's hard to change somebody's behavior. You have to save time or money. And, you know, people who lived in Chicago and worked in that building for 30 years didn't think that you know, a guy could come in from DC and take a look at their traffic patterns and analyze it. And that guy wasn't me. I'm not smart enough to do that, but I brought Justin along with me, um, you know, and looked at their traffic patterns and everybody was, you know, going crazy uh, in our initial tenant meetings and, you know, said that we're doing it wrong and it's not going to work and everything. A week later, you know, the, the response was great uh, and the shuttle head times were, were faster and everybody kind of just, you know, went away quietly. Um, so positive tenant feedback, improved performance. We're going to keep an eye on it, but our goal is to expand the lift program. How can I now? Now I'm, you know, getting greedy. Now I want to reduce it by even more. How do I take more shuttles out? Do I put, you know, a lift option and a shuttle option in at at the two major um, commuter stations in Chicago, 
And that's what we're looking at is what's the next step, is how do we continue to reduce this and use these existing technologies in order you know, to, to continue those steps down the road. And again, in our national portfolio, Beacon owns properties all over the country. Um, and we've shared, you know, we share successes everywhere that we go. Um, you know, it's, it's funny that it's not just in suburban office parks, you know, that are, you know, away from public transit. This building in Chicago is in right in downtown. But it's just what are what are pe people willing to do? How far are they willing to walk? Typically in Chicago, they'll walk a decent way. It's like almost a mile in a in the CBD location. But when it's you know 20 degrees below zero they would much rather have a shuttle, you know, versus taking a cab or something else. So providing some of those last mile amenities are huge, even in CBD areas. Um, so we're enhancing our tenant amenity programs, reducing expenses, connecting urban offices, and then, you know, reducing future needs in, in uh, future parking needs in developments. You know, the more autonomous cars and lift options, you know, stuff like this, carpools, van pools, in our future developments, parking garages cost so much money to, to, for us to build We'd rather use the money to, you know, build out, you know, make the building even better, the part that you're actually using versus the part that you pull into, park your car, and then come back, you know, 10 hours later. So if we can reduce the parking structures and parking counts, then we can spend that money somewhere else in the building to make the building more attractive and, you know, and easy to use. Um, so in our future development, ground up development, we certainly look at transportation. And then we also do, we do, we, we buy buildings, you know, where there's a creative use and sometimes there's space limitations and physical limitations in it. So, you know, solutions like this, um, you know, are really able to help us, you know, find, you know, creative ways to get around it, using it in Virginia, you know, in Crystal City, we're using it in the suburbs, we're using it in Chicago. So I think that, you know, in a, you know, a really short conversation, I think that, you know, we've successfully implemented these and there's tons of benefits out there for you. Shane, thank you so much. Uh, great perspective uh, overall from, from the owners, and again, you're able to talk about it on the national side as well. Um, our next panelist talking from the property manager's perspective is Susan Hammer. And just quickly, Susan uh, deserves a little bit of background here. She has over 31 years of high-rise commercial property management experience. Uh, overseeing assets in several U.S. markets, but is currently, as you see here, the Vice President and General Manager for JLL Managing AMA Plaza. Um, she's received, received numerous awards, including those from Building Owners and Managers Association of Chicago, and is a leader in sustainability initiatives and has received additional environmental awards and certifications for the property she oversees. So, Susan, without further ado, we'll turn it over to you to talk about AMA Plaza's efforts from your perspective. Thank you, Justin. Um, my job uh, was to take Beacon's vision, as Shane so eloquently uh, uh, told you about, and implement it at AMA Plaza. Um, a manager's experience with tenants helps determine the best way to manage the change in expectations and to predict their reactions. And our goal was tenant satisfaction and, of course, ultimately uh, tenant retention. And that successful outcome can only be achieved if you successfully communicate and manage the change to tenant employees, especially those people who have relied on the shuttle program for over 10 years. We approached the change, a fewer buses, uh, three buses instead of four, with the same uh, interval between buses, which is 10 minutes, a completely different route, including driving two blocks north to then go south to the train station and on a completely different street, and uh, the new concept of lift. And I used a, a five-point planning program of uh, predict, preempt, promote, prepare, and process. And this approach will work for, a new, uh, for new programs as well as mature ones like we have here at AMA Plaza. The, uh, I knew some of the objections ahead of the first communication and before the tenant meeting, such as you will never make the promised times, we'll miss our trains, the psychological objections of why go north to go south, the riders at the least used and eliminated uh, train station would feel like second class citizens. But uh, we prepared for these objections at the tenant meeting by including everyone who has a stake in the process, including the consultant, management of course, the owners, the bus company, and Lyft representatives. And they were able to answer these questions and provide credibility to the process. Other questions they were prepared to answer included, 
How do you know this will work? Did you test it? Yes. Did you test it at rush hour? Yes. Did you test it at rush hour on Friday? Yes. The people who completed the research and knew the answers were in attendance, and it was stressed that Lyft riders will also have this cool app just for them. Of course, we emphasized less time commuting, more convenience, and less cost. We promoted it by driving the positive message up to and through the launch. Lyft representatives were on hand in the lobby for a couple of days to help people with the app and answer questions. We prepared a communication program to remind and inform the tenants consistently up to and through the launch. And preparation. We tried to think of everything that could go wrong and make a change if, as needed. Unfortunately, we did not think of everything when we launched on the first day. There was a large musical festival in Chicago, so the new route was jammed due to street closures, and we did not take this into account. However, we were able to quickly reroute later buses around the affected areas. There were, unfortunately, a few people who missed their trains. One person even emailed me, said that she was never going to take the bus again. However, and this makes the last step, the process, important, extremely important. The process to responding to those complaints is going to drive the success of the program. The new bus schedule and route stabilized, but there were still people who were uncertain or needed assistance navigating the Lyft app. Process included immediate responses, willingness to resolve and respond to any complaint, again from all stakeholders involved, the management, consultant, the bus company, and Lyft. That rider who said she was never going to ride again returned as a faithful user of the shuttle. I believe in part because she was able to communicate directly with management and the bus company and received an understanding and informed response. We found that people who had not used the shuttle bus to go to the lesser used station because they were the last group dropped off are now using the lift surface. It's personalized and it takes less time. Management and ownership goals align uh, with the intended results of this program. The benefits of a successful shuttle ride hailing program for tenants are shorter commute times, and that has been proven by the results and for both shuttle and lift users, reduction in operating expenses. It enhances a property sustainability profile by encouraging alternative transportation method methods and reduces carbon emissions. It can be customized to a suburban or an urban property. Since the program launched on August 1st, we have seen a 7% increase in overall ridership with one less stop, which equates to about 500 more rides per month. The ridership for Lyft uh, from the former third stop has not changed from the bus ridership for that stop. We have not received a complaint for either ride ridership base for about eight weeks. So finally, this amenity increases tenant and workplace satisfaction, which starts from how the change is presented and managed. An existing and mature amenity was transformed into a fresh and modern program, and it is, seems to be very successful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, for the sake of our audience, I wanted to ask if you all could stay with us a little longer. We've had some great content so far. Uh, from the owner's perspective with Shane, from the property manager's perspective uh, with Susan, and we have a, a great final part here, which is with Charles Frank talking from Lyft's perspective and the operation side. So we hope you can stay on and share our questions with us um, toward the end. So uh, with that, Charles, I'm going to give you a, a quick introduction here and turn it over to you. Great, great. So, uh, Charles, uh, Charles is a mobility solutions manager for Lyft, and which many of you may know is an on-demand ride or, uh, service company headquartered in San Francisco. And Charles manages the strategic accounts in their real estate vertical, which focuses on bringing custom solutions to match a building's ground transportation needs. Um, in addition to his passion for real estate, Charles enjoys spending time with his family, open water swimming, and San Francisco Bay Area sports. We're a little jealous with your basketball team, Charles, but uh, thanks for joining us today and sharing the ride hailers perspective. Thanks so much for having me on today. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity. So I will uh, be as quick, I will go as quick as I can here because I know time is short. 
but I really wanted to start with uh, some data. And uh, I think that this is a pretty pretty interesting data point that 24% of all Lyft rides either start or end near a public transit station. Uh, Lyft does close to 1.2 million rides a day in over 400 markets in the U.S. with uh, expansion to Toronto at, in December. So um, this isn't a small number, excuse me, a small number. Um, but the reason for this is car attitude, car ownership attitude is really changing. And uh, less than 70% of 19-year-olds now own a car, which is down from 87% two decades ago. And if we look at the millennial population, the number of drivers has decreased by 23% over the past decade. So cars are expensive, parking is expensive, and it, you know, no, no wonder that more and more people are using public transit. So the program here is uh, a program that we, we've come up with and we created, and it's really a first mile, last mile. And these programs are designed to help people with that, that exact thing, it's getting them from that last mile, and usually that's a public transit station, to their office or to their home. And these rides can be fully subsidized by the building operator. They can be partially subsidized, but ultimately all programs are customized for you. So the, the tools here for our Public Transit Connect are, are pretty simple. And uh, number one would be geofencing. And what geofencing allows us to do is restrict, or sub, re restrict rides during two specific locations. So a ride from A to B is what you're paying for. You don't want to pay for a ride from A to C. So our technology re recognizes that this, these rides are going from A to B and will subsidize it based on that location. We can also restrict the time. So if you only want this program to be available during commute hours, uh, maybe your commute hours might be different. You can select those and you're able to restrict it based on that time. Um, but one thing that not a lot of people think about is that not everyone has a smartphone. So we do have the ability that an individual can call in and a ride can be dispatched to the, that individual based on um, the call that they've made, and normally that's going to be managed by the front desk. So this is what it looks like in your app. You can see on the right-hand side there is a, a image of China Basin, and what it shows is five locations that are in pink, that are pink dots. Those are locations that this building, China Basin, had said they are allowing individuals to take rides to and from those locations during commute hours. You can see on the left side of that, there's actually, right in this section, it shows what's available to you. So it'll show that the max ride costs. It will show you that how many rides you have remaining, when it's available. And when you select on that coverage area, this is location that shows. So what I want to uh, you know, close with is a use case that we have here in San Francisco, California. And this, this building, in particular China Basin, had decided that they were going to get rid of their shuttles altogether. And to, to Susan's point earlier, the first week is always a little rocky. Um, since then, we're now saving them over $500,000 a year just for the one shuttle program that they had going. And we have, we've seen increased satisfaction, decreased ETAs, and uh, overall a much better experience for the, for the riders. Great. Great. Charles, thank you very much. Um, again, thanks for everyone for hanging on a little longer. We want to try to respect your time and keep uh, this as close to the half hour we designated as possible. But before we open up, well, the floor is now open to questions. So we encourage anybody who is listening in from our audience to type your questions into the panel on the right of your screen. Um, but while we wait for folks to answer questions, we may have uh, time for a few here. Charles, I wanted to ask you, um, you gave a nice overview there of how the, the app works and how this type of geofencing works. Um, and so certainly you've done this in other contexts, but how is this project that you've worked with us on in Chicago at AMA Plaza different from other ones that you have worked on in the past? Charles, are you on mute? Sorry, I was, spe I, I was speaking on mute. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And what we found is that every building is going to have different wants and different needs. 
So something that was different in the AMA Plaza situation was they decided as opposed to using the Lyft line service, which would be sharing the ride, that they would allow th these individuals to use, which, and let me take one step back, Lyft line is normally 40% less than the traditional Lyft Classic. And uh, the, the building management had decided that as opposed to using the Lyft line mode, they wanted to use Lyft Classic, so everybody has their ride. Um, so with that, that was a, a slight change. There was also a different change in uh, funding, so how, how it was going to be paid for, and you know, through that, we were able to come up with the, the correct payment methods that they wanted to use. Uh, that was subsidizing everything after a certain dollar amount, um, and you know, with that, We've seen, just to, uh, to Susan's point earlier, a understanding of how the program works um, has gone from a who moved, who moved my cheese to everybody is uh, up and using the program. We've also seen ETAs reduce as more drivers realize that this is a program that's up and running in the area. So ETAs have uh, gone down because of that. Great. Thank you, Charles. We've had a couple questions come in uh, while you were providing that great answer. Um, one, we will, uh, Marina, address your question by sending out the contact information for all our panelists to all attendees after the panel is completed today. Um, but there was another question. Jacob, you had the question, which is, is this program scalable? Uh, the example of AMA Plaza is a very large property with very large savings. Can it be done for smaller sites? Um, Shane, I think it may be, maybe we could start with you since I think the savings are the part that you're most focused on. What are your thoughts? Does that, does this type of thing apply to something that's less than one and a half million square feet? Yeah, for sure, because you're just paying for um, the actual use. Like, you know, we find, uh, you know, I'm based in D.C. and a lot of our buildings are smaller. We have some that are, you know, only 250,000 square feet. And a, and a solution like this is flexible to the is completely scalable you know there's a baseline cost you can either do it yourself or you can you know I use Justin um, you know or another firm to uh, manage uh, the transportation program but you know a small baseline cost um, for them to deal with setting people up with Lyft and you know uh, some of the, the initial setup areas and then do the billing and that kind of stuff but then you're only paying for the for the for people that are using it. So there's times. I mean, we have properties in you know in a Virginia suburb that we're paying $125,000 a year for uh, that we may see like seven people use in a day. And and at that point, it's just a marketing thing and a check the box thing. We're required to have it by leases, but we're looking to implement this system there because instead of just paying a flat $125,000, I can pay maybe you know 10 grand and then I just pay as it's used. So I think totally, whether you have 10 people or 10 million people, solutions like this are great. And I think Charles could probably give you more stats on how many Lyft vehicles are out there, but I know that there's tons of Lyft and Uber vehicles and you know rideshare vehicles out there. So I think the supply of cars is out there, so it, it gives you the, the flexibility to do it at any size property. Thank you, Shane. Um, just scrolling down here to make sure we haven't uh, missed any opportunities to ask any other questions of our panel. Um, while we do that, I think you, you addressed this a, a, oops, a little bit, um, Charles, but nationally, what types of environments are you seeing this model happen in? I mean, we heard from Shane saying this could be replicated anywhere. Um, you know, suburbs, urban, but what are you seeing with Lyft? Yeah, so what we're seeing is uh, the first the first takers, if you will, have been more in the city core, and a lot of that's because they're already providing uh, some sort of shuttle service. Uh, you know, the expectation on a lot of these properties as uh, leases, you know, as Shane mentioned, continue to get more and more competitive. Uh, you know, expectations of what's being provided are, are those things that end up, uh, you know, being decisions. So we see this, you know, we see these working all across the country, uh, whether it be major metropolitans or smaller submarkets. A lot of it's just dependent upon what you're currently using um, and what you're looking for and 
you know, we, we can create programs around uh, what you're what you need. But you know, in the short to answer your, your question, um, I would say the the biggest programs are in cities. Uh, the second are the ones that are just outside of the city core. And of course, you know, we also have suburban users as well. Great. Thank you so much, Charles. Again, I would like to thank all three of our panelists, Shane, Susan, Charles. Thank you so much for providing so much great content for people out there who may be contemplating the same thing. You know, I think the, what we found today is that uh, Lyft is definitely, and ride hailing is definitely a solution for buildings looking to do that last mile connection. It can be done on its own. It can be done in connection with a shuttle. And this is a great example of where the two come together very nicely to provide sort of an optimal solution. Um, our last slide here, you see you have contact information for myself and my colleague Courtney. For anybody on the call as, a, as an attendee who may have other questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today or you think of later on, please feel free to reach out to us and we will circle back with our panelists uh, and get you an answer uh, very shortly. But in the meantime, we just want to remind you that uh, we have a number of panels coming up in the next several months, which you'll be hearing about from us uh, with future communications. Um, and also, if you want to hear this again, we were recording this presentation. So if at any point in time you, there were some pieces of information that you uh, wanted to revisit, you can circle back and listen to that. We'll be sending that out to everybody that attended today's event. So thank you again to our panelists. Thanks for everybody who was able to join us today. And we look forward to being in touch with all of you in January when we resume our webinar series. But in the meantime, we wish you all a healthy, happy holiday season. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, Justin.